All right, good afternoon and welcome back to First Thought Focus. First Thought Focus is our virtual conference series that aims to showcase the breadth and depth of First Thought's experts within the life sciences industry, while also covering a wide range of topics that are relevant and important to the healthcare space. Most recently, we just had we hosted a discussion with Dr. Bernard Fox from the Providence Cancer Institute, where we reviewed data from the 2021 SITSI annual meeting. You can find the replay of that event, as well as other replays and info on upcoming events, such as our um, ASH doubleheader next week, on our website, firstthought.io slash focus. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Jonathan Powell, who will be discussing with Neil recent research innovations on the topic of tumor metabolism. As a quick reminder before we get started, we will be taking questions from the audience at the end of today's discussion. You can um, submit your questions anonymously at any time via email to hello at firstthought.io. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our moderator and veteran science journalist, Neil Canavan. Hi there. Uh, once again, welcome to our First Thought webinar series on translational medicine, trends and topics. My name is Neil Canavan, the managing director of the KOL Network here at LiSci. And our topic for today is tumor metabolism. We're gonna discuss everything from PET scans to keto diets. My guest today is Dr. Jonathan Powell, MD, PhD, who after 20 years at the bench at Johns Hopkins, where he studied the ins and outs of the immune system in general and tumor metabolism in particular, has in the last year signed on as head of oncology at Calico Life Sciences in San Francisco. Jonathan, congrats, congratulations on joining the dark side and welcome. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, our agenda today is roughly this. See if I can get that first graphic up. So we will discuss what I hope is not too long. Uh, is that great? Oh, there it is. There it is, Jessica. Let me coordinate my screen. And we will discuss today, or hope for not as too long, the graduate school nightmare called the Krebs cycle. And I'm just going to leave this graphic up for a few moments. So like I'll stare at it in horror. Believe me, this is one of the simplest illustrations I could find of this process. From there, we're gonna to go to a, a brief overview of the process of glycolysis and then how this all goes wonky in tumor metabolism. With that basic science table setting, we will then dig into Dr. Powell's paper on the topic on this topic, uh, published in September of 2019 in one of the highest impact journals around, and that would be science. And for me, this really, this work really blew the lid off the joint as far as understanding what we could do with this technology and the science. Following that, uh, the remainder of our time will be a discussion on the various uh, metabolic targets under drug development consideration and potential successes and roadblocks thereof. As always, during the course of our conversation, we will be taking questions on the topic that is being discussed at that moment. If you're just not getting it, put your hand up and we'll clarify. For the rest of the questions at the 45 minute mark, we will entertain any questions pertaining to the, the tumor metabolism setting in general. So here we go. If we could have the picture there, putting everything all together. This shows us, and I, I would first, before we go into this, uh, call the audience's attention to the lower right and glutamine. This will figure very prominently in our talk today. There we be. So this is also combined with the, uh, the glycolysis. So we have all these things together. Now, Jonathan, as briefly as is scientifically ethical, Describe for us just basically what is all this for? What is it doing? What does it make? And then we will go into uh, the problems that, uh, that occur when it goes awry. Yeah, absolutely. So um, certainly, many, probably like many of you, I thought um, I would memorize this the night before the exam, take the <laughs> exam, and then uh, forget about it. And particularly as a, you know, someone interested in uh, immunology, I thought, my God, you know, how, you know, that's it. I don't need to learn anymore. But what's really, you know, absolutely fascinating is um, how much um, this is play, plays a role in, in the things that I'm interested in. Like, for example, uh, you know, making cytokines, killing tumor cells, you know, absolutely the functions that, um, you know, as immunologists, you, you know, we really uh, want to understand and in the case of immunotherapy, want to um, enhance. So just um, a couple of things is that, you know, um, 
you know, we all learned in, um, in uh, you know, college or graduate school or medical school, this kind of concept that uh, glycolysis or anaerobic uh, glycolysis is what cells utilize uh, in the absence of oxygen. And, and the end result is you get like four ATP out of that. And that's the top part here. You convert glucose um, uh, to pyruvate and along the way end up with four uh, ATP. Um, two, um, you, you, you actually, uh, you spend two during the process, but you also um, generate uh, some when glycolysis and then the other two come from the pentose phosphate shunt. And then we're told like in the presence of oxygen, our cells, they use a different process essentially, the TCI cycle, the Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, which is shown in the bottom, which is um, a process where you kind of spin around the TCA cycle and along the way generate upwards of around 36 ATP. Um, and, you, and of course, this is an oxygen requiring process. And, and you know, the example I like to give is that when, when you're running or doing something athletic, and then you, you, you kind of feel the burn, you know, in a sense, that's lactic acid buildup. And, and so what it signifies is that there's not enough oxygen for your particular function to go around. So, um, you know, the cells can't completely use oxphos. They're, they're utilizing some glycolysis and you get the buildup of lactic acid. And that's that, you know, that was the, you know, kind of dogma that we, that we all learned. Um, but, you know, um, but, but actually, um, it turns out that you know that that was far too simplified and actually not the case. And so, um, in particular, um, what has become very apparent is is that first of all, glycolysis plays an, an exceedingly important role, um, even in the presence of oxygen. In particular, um, for cells that are rapidly proliferating, like tumor cells, and and also to some extent, uh, immune cells like T cells. And that the second thing is is that Whereas we, the real focus in terms of what we've learned, what we've been taught and what we think of in terms of oxidative phosphorylation is what I mentioned, the generation of energy or ATP. In fact, these processes are really important uh, for providing substrates for, for what I call the scientific term stuff, right? <laughs> and and the, reason, the reason this is important, particularly when you think of tumors, is, is that you can't proliferate like crazy without stuff. And so what do I mean by stuff? Simply nucleic acids, lipids, and proteins. And so um, tumors kill you by proliferating uncontrollably and invading parts of your body. And if they don't have the building blocks to do that, then they can't. And in fact, the way they generate those building blocks is, is and in fact, all cells, you know, is by um, these, these substrates that emerge from various, um, uh, various parts of both uh, of the TCA cycle. So, you know, we need to think of these processes, not just as energy generating, but critical for generating the substrates that are necessary to promote uh, proliferation. Excellent. Thank you for that very much. All right, now let's go into the troublesome wonky part. Uh, in a nutshell, this is why PET scans work. Uh, tumors and nutrient hogs that pollute the environment. Now uh, on the lower left, is it? Yes, lower left. Do, 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 do. Get a little screen. Sorry, a little screen issues. <clears throat> So on the lower left, uh, there's a phrase, please note, by Patrick Huey. He's, he's the CEO of Moffitt Cancer Center. And he once said to me, fruit is nature's candy. And he didn't mean that in a good way, since Patrick is a big fan of keto diets. And time permitting, at the end of our talk, I'd like to touch on that. But first, Jonathan, tell us how a man named Otto Warburg, in 1925, discovered the effect that bears his name and later won a Nobel Prize for it. And again, audience, take note of where glutamine is in this. Yeah, so um, uh, Warburg effect, Warburg physiology, sometimes it's even called aerobic glycolysis, probably not a good description, but I mentioned it's because you'll hear that. So what Warburg noticed is what any of you who've worked in the lab in tissue culture have noticed. And that is when you have your cell lines, which are essentially um, uh, tumor cells, right? When you grow them in media uh, and um, the media turns yellow, Right. And so what exactly does that mean? I always actually I always thought, well, it turned yellow 
be, because there are a lot of cells there and, 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 and the, the, the media color is actually a pH indicator. So the more yellow it turns, the more acidic the media is. When it's very pink, it means it's less acidic. And so um, what he noticed was, is that when you grow cancer cells, that they are producing a lot of lactic acid, which of course is the end product of glycolysis. So he, he, he came up with this idea that tumor cells use glycolysis even in the presence of oxygen, which I, which I told you at the time was kind of radical. And even in your biochemistry class was probably radical, right? And so that was, um, that, 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 that was his um, observation. Now, interestingly, the cause of that, he thought, he, he was wrong actually. He thought that the, the cause of this was um, uh, that, that tumors had um, dysfunctional mitochondria, right? And so, um, so he, that's what he attributed to. As I mentioned uh, before, we know that there's nothing dysfunctional about it. It's just a strategy of the tumor cells um, to generate both energy to grow, which is not limiting. And, and in a sense, this is what Patrick uh, means by candy, right? Um, for tumors, the, the limiting factor is not that there's not enough glucose around, right? It's not that there's enough, not enough energy around. That, that's no problem. Tumors have no problem getting energy. What they have a problem with or what they need is generating uh, the substrates for nucleic acids, lipids, and um, and proteins. And so in a sense, what they do is they say, and this is simplified, but it's where, you know, we can think about it, is that the tumors say, look, I, I, I can generate enough ATP using glycolysis, but what I really need are lipids, amino acids, and, um, and nucleic acids so I can grow. And so the tumors are willing to generate the extra ATP using, generate ATP using glycolysis, but instead of using the TCA cycle for energy, they spin off the different substrates into processes, metabolic processes, which lead to the generation of stuff, right? And so that's, that's like sort of the working going idea as to why um, highly proliferative cells, tumor cells are so glycolytic. All right, so now let's move on to uh, the challenge itself. So let's get up a picture of, of what can go wrong and where. There we are, okay. Now, this is all that can go wrong. It's really complex. There's lots of crosstalk. Doctor, given this complexity, first tell us how you came to select glutamine as the target for your work. I mean, yeah. isn't there a choice that would be more discreet? Yes, so so that's a that's a great that's a great question. I'll tell you our answer, an answer that probably drug companies would have would have, and in fact, just completely cast aside. So, so our this was our rationale, and I'm ha happy to share it with you. Is that you know tumors are incredibly clever, right? So if you um, if you block one pathway, they just readily figure a way around it. And actually, I can give you a really instructive example, and that is the fact that Calathera just killed their glutaminase uh, program, right? And so uh, they thought, you know, their rationale was, well, we know glutamine is really important because if you look at this figure, actually there are some better figures, the, the glutamine um, enters the TCA cycle and the carbons and nitrogens from glutamine end up in, in all the things I told you about. Like you can trace them to amino acids, you can trace them to lipids, you can trace them to nucleic acids. So they said, oh, well, we know glutaminase is really important in having glutamine enter the TCA cycle. And so they block glutaminase. But we, the, our rationale was we knew, we, we thought, that if you block one pathway, that the tumor will just get around it. So we said, in light of the fact that glutamine is so important, in, like I said, you find the carbons and the nitrogens from glutamine end up in lipid synthesis, nucleic acid synthesis, and amino acid synthesis. We want to block not just one um, uh, glutamine pathway, we want to block them all. And so, so that was our rationale. We wanted to, we figured that if we could block the utilization of glutamine 
by um, uh, tumors, then we could in multiple different ways. And in fact, I can be even more specific, 11 plus different enzymes uh, employ glutamine as a substrate in, in all these metabolic pathways. So in a sense, we, we thought the best idea was not to inhibit one of them glutaminase, but rather to try to inhibit as many as we can, 11 if we could, and thereby block all the ways in which glutamine can enter these pathways and, um, and, and promote the growth of tumors. So, so that was kind of our idea. So awesome idea, hypothesis are always awesome. So now let's see if it works. And we're, doctor, if I could have you tell us the story of the science paper. That paper is entitled, Glutamine Blockade Induces Divergent Metabolic Programs to Overcome Tumor Immune Evasion. And as I said, this occurred in the Journal of Science in 2019. So, oh, by the way, I just want to mention that this is one of the most clearly written papers I've ever read. I mean, really nice job. But to save us all the time of reading it again, uh, what describe the experiment. Yeah, so, um, so, so actually it's really, it's really the evolution of what happened. So, so I told you our rationale and that was from the start, but the evolution of what we found in terms of the divergence was a little bit of a surprise. So really the field of uh, immunometabolism, at least, you know, people can argue with me, but I attribute, you know, its recent, you know, explosion to a lot of the work that came out of Craig Thompson's lab. And he, um, uh, he, uh, uh, when he was at Penn, now he's at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he really was one of the first people to make the analogy between rapidly proliferating uh, T cells and tumor cells and, and showing that T cells, for example, employed Warburg physiology. So based on, and, and that absolutely was absolutely instrumental in kind of all the progress that's been made in, in immunometabolism, because that was sort of the starting point of us connecting um, immune function with metabolic uh, programming. And so initially when we um, put together our paper, I told you our rationale, you know, we, we were interested in um, immunotherapy. And so our strategy was gonna be this, is we knew that tumors grew really fast and that was bad for um, immunotherapy. We knew that as a consequence of the tumor metabolism that it made the tumor microenvironment um, acidic, right? I told you a lot of lactic acid produced, hypoxic because a lot of the tumors suddenly didn't care that much about oxygen and um, uh, um, uh, hypoxic and um, uh, acidic and nutrient depleted because the tumors won the battle in all the nutrients. They would have these mechanisms to suck up um, uh, um, things like glutamine and glucose, et cetera. So the, the original idea was let's block tumor metabolism using the, uh, something that blocks glutamine metabolism. And then after we kind of disable the tumor, change the microenvironment, um, initiate immunotherapy, kind of like disable the shields and you know, cut out the engine of the, of, the, uh, 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 of the enemy vessel if you're like into like Star Trek or anything, and then they, they go in and attack. And so that's the way we initially uh, did our experiments because we were concerned that if we tried to initiate immunotherapy in the presence of the glutamine antagonist, that we would inhibit the immunotherapy, right? Again, based on this, you know, this kind of the beautiful concepts that emerged from originally from uh, Craig Thompson's work. But it turned out, and again, this is why you do the experiments. So initially we did the experiments where we would add the glutamine antagonists and then add, for example, anti-PD-1. And every time the, the, the students in the lab would show me the data, they always showed me the data where they added everything simultaneously. And I said, why are you doing it simultaneously? You know, I think we should do it sequentially. And they said, well, every time we do it sequentially, it doesn't work as well. And so finally, when we kept getting the same data all the time, we, we realized we couldn't ignore it. And so this really led us to this idea of divergence. That is, even though T cells proliferate, their ultimate function and their ultimate uh, metabolic programming is in fact different than that of the tumors, okay? It's not exactly the same. There are similarities, but it's not exactly the same. And what we found was by... Uh, that, that actually blocking glutamine in the case of T-cell metabolism actually promoted 
It, whereas it inhibited massive proliferation, it actually promoted the generation of um, really robust uh, memory cells. And so even though, in, so for example, just to give you an example, instead of getting a million cells in the presence of the glutamine antagonist, maybe we would only get, um, you know, you know, I'm making up these numbers, but you know, maybe we'd only get like um, 100,000 cells, but all 100,000 of those cells were amazing at killing tumors because we reprogrammed uh, those cells. And that kind of led to the idea that when you um, block glutamine in the tumor, you're doing something different than when you block tumor, uh, block glutamine in the T cell. And in fact, the function of a tumor cell and the function of a T cells are, are quite different, right? So it's not that hard to imagine. And that's shown here in that, um, you know, uh, showing like, so for example, if you look at all the red arrows, when we added our glutamine antagonist MC38, which is one of the tumor cell lines, you can see we really inhibit a lot of the processes involved in um, uh, proliferation, which of course is kind of the raison d'etre of a tumor. On the other hand, when we inhibited um, T uh, glutamine uh, metabolism in the T cells, you can see that we reprogram the T cell in a, two things happen. First of all, we reprogram the T cell in a way, again, it wasn't the best proliferator, but it learned how to live longer and, and be more uh, productive. And the second thing is, we found that the, the T cell says, okay, I can't use glutamine, but I can use acetate. And so T cells were able to readjust and use acetate to fuel their TCA cycle, um, whereas the tumors weren't. And so again, that represents the divergence of the pathways and really um, you know, demonstrates in, in, in really a really nice form where um, just because inhibiting glutamine uh, decreases proliferation of tumor cells doesn't necessarily mean it has a bad effect on T cells. In fact, it wasn't even a neutral effect. It was actually, um, it, it actually enhanced their, um, their metabolism. The, the second thing, and, and, and I want to bring this up because I think it's equally important, is that these are the good guys. The T cells are the good guys, right? But we also published this, another paper in JCI that, that looked at actually um, um, uh, you know, uh, macrophages, particularly myeloid-derived mm -hmm. suppressor cells. And you know, those guys, those are the bad guys because they suppress immune responses and they live in the tumor. So they're like, they're not just any old macrophage. They're like these macrophages that have taken up shop within the tumor. In fact, if you look at a tumor, meaning a growth, it's chock full of macrophages. And most of them are not doing good things for the host, but rather helping the tumor. And so the question arises, well, how can these uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells live in the tumor microenvironment? And the answer is, is that they adopt a lot of the same metabolic um, pathways and programs that the tumor uses. So they can live in this hypoxic acidic environment. And again, when we added the glutamine antagonists to them, we actually disabled the bad guys. And again, why? Because their, their metabolism was much more like that of the um, uh, tumor. So their metabolism was not divergent, but rather similar. And consequently, by inhibiting glutamine metabolism, we were able to inhibit um, both the tumor itself, change the microenvironment, but also inhibit these bad guys, while simultaneously, as a consequence of the divergence, enhance uh, the ability of T cells to become memory cells, live a long time, repro ultimately reproduce and kill the tumor. All right. Tour de force. That was wonderful. Uh, I just need to mention one thing. Uh, you're you're at home and someone's banging around in the background. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, it's outside the um, the working oh. on the um, street. So, right, right, so if we're... it gets in, if it gets intolerable, let me know. Um, okay, I, I can try to. Well, I can hear everything clearly. It's just okay. Um, so obviously, I mean, to me, I assume to you and to the people at Science, this was a real aha. Wow. Uh, what was the reaction from your peers? Did they like? Nah, maybe. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, uh, the initial um, gut reaction is how come you're not inhibiting the T cell responses? And, and so, um, you know, so first of all, we took great care to demonstrate, you know, we were prepared for that to be the answer, right? So that was not the critical part of our original hypothesis. Again, why did we propose this? Because this is what the data was telling us. 
And so, um, so, um, so I think that there was a lot of kind of um, skepticism on, on, on that part. But again, um, but, so, but our peers certainly accepted the data. It's more uh, like drug companies and things like that, 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 that it didn't make sense to them because if you inhibit all glutamine pathways, then you should be doing bad things to the immune system. And right. so, 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 so that was actually where we, we um, ultimately found the, um, the, the uh, biggest uh, resistance. And then, you know, I got to say that these type of experiments have been uh, reproduced um, in, in other labs, both academic labs across the country for which we have nothing to do with them. And then also even uh, in industry. Um, so, you know, so it's one of the more robust findings we've ever had because it's so easily uh, reproducible. So. Well, so, uh, so robust, in fact, uh, it led to the founding of two companies by yourself and several others, uh, Drayson Pharmaceuticals and Citrix Therapeutics. We, you well, may touch so I should say that yep. this, this really, um, um, this really had nothing to do with Citrix. You know, they, oh, okay. they maybe only in the sense that maybe they were convinced I knew a little bit about something about <laughs> ableism to con to have me contribute to them. So, but Drayson is really the company that um, picked up on this finding. Okay, well. Um, we have these suggested uh, metabolism related targets. I'd like to bring up yet another graphic. This is from one of your papers. This is from Dr. Powell's 2020 Nature Reviews cancer paper simply titled Metabolism of Immune Cells in Cancer. Again, thank you for the simplicity of all this. Um, Jonathan, uh, you got any favors, favorites here? Well, um, you know, I'll just tell you that our lab has, you know, just, you know, looking at the um, graphic, you know, I could tell you one thing that we've worked with uh, quite a bit is the um, adenosine pathway, you know, um, which uh, I think is, is still very interesting. The knockout mice, the data were spectacular. Um, at, you know, um, adenosine pathway drugs are in the clinic and they're showing some, uh, some uh, you know, kind of responses, but not what we saw with the knockout. And so I think it remains to be seen whether we just need to make better uh, drugs in that pathway. Um, the other things, you know, again, what we would, what we would you know, say are really good targets are ones that um, you know ultimately lead to the inhibition of um, of uh, of substrates that um, that that promote uh, growth and 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 again I think that um, you, you know that's a really uh, that's a really good way to look at it and 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 one thing that I will say and, and we've published this concept I I can't remember if it's in this paper or not is that it's something that I'll, I'll say, and, and if there's anyone out there from industry, they'll probably ignore me because um, this is not an industry concept and now I'm in industry, is that, <laughs> um, you know, uh, everyone talks about targeted therapy, right? And they talk about, um, they talk about, you know, trying to inhibit something that's in the tumor, but not in cells of the rest of the body. And there's this incredible fear that if you inhibit a pathway that's found in, in normal cells that you're gonna cause, um, you, you know, you're gonna have adverse events. And so one thing that, you know, we noticed from uh, this paper and, and also in general from our other studies is a concept we call cellular selectivity based upon demand. And that is that you can inhibit, you can use uh, an inhibitor that will inhibit a process that may be found in every cell in the body, right? So there's no cellular selectivity of your inhibitor. However, the selectivity of the inhibitor comes in the fact that the cells that have the greatest demand for that pathway, those are the cells that are gonna be most affected. And so for example, to give an example, our glutamine, um, uh, our glutamine drug, the vast majority of cells in the body could care less that we're inhibiting every glutamine pathway you know, by uh, target with the glutamine antagonist. The cells that care the most are, for example, tumor cells. T cells care because we're reprogramming them. Uh, and also at very high doses, you'll start to inhibit things like the bone marrow, the bone marrow care, cares, and epithelial cells of the gut care because they're constantly um, turning over. 
But, but the point is, is that if you have an inhibitor of the glutamine pathway, if you have an inhibitor of glycolysis, even glycolysis is everywhere. Um, I think that the point is, is that you can find that these inhibitors will turn out to be incredibly effective without causing all the dire um, um, uh, side effects that you would predict um, uh, by, you know, just, you know, uh, theoretically, because the, the cells that are affected most by inhibiting all the, any of these metabolic pathways are going to be the ones that have the greatest demand for the pathway. Um, I, I need to point out a, a fairly famous fail in the IO world, which is IDO, which is figures prominently in that last graphic. Do you have any insight as to why that didn't work? Well, so I think that, um, yeah, so I, I would say because it was developed in a it was very poor fashion, right? So they had initial, you know, they had initial really interesting data and then went straight to a phase three clinical trial and failed, right? Um, and so that so that's the the big answer, to be honest with you. And probably and the question is whether it ever it, that failure killed the drug forever. I don't know. You know, there may be still companies working on it. A couple of things, though, I, I, I would like to point out is that. The IDO is dependent upon, IDO is upregulated by gamma interferon. So in a sense, it's depend, you would imagine that it's dependent upon having a good immune response, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so I would imagine that an IDO inhibitor might actually be very useful ultimately in, in a, you know, as complementing a drug, other drugs that, that do increase um, immune response. Now it was tried with PD-1, um, but maybe not in the most strategic um, uh, fashion. The other thing that I would like to point out, and, and this is my, this is a little bit, uh, you know, my bias, it's not, certainly not to speak against IDO, is that um, the IDO inhibitor has, has no effect on tumor growth, right? And so I think that um, that's something that you, you, you need to keep in mind. Like the one kind of really neat thing about, you know, inhibiting the glutamine pathway is that you're literally inhibiting tumor growth, right? That's A number one. And you're also promoting, um, uh, you're also promoting uh, immune responses. And so, you know, again, maybe the IDO inhibitor is best used in something that really inhibits tumor growth. And, and you could add it along with something that's going to enhance uh, cancer immunotherapy. So, um, all right, well, let's um, go to a few other possibilities. The next graphic, uh, I would apologize for the quality of this image. I literally had to cut and paste to get all these uh, drugs on the same shot. Um, Jonathan, at a glance, okay, every, everybody in the audience just, just hit the plus and, and, and try to blow up that image. Yeah, there we go. So what, what strikes me, Jonathan, about this is all the NAs. So I don't know if that's not applicable or never again, or I'm not sure. Uh, are these things failed or targets that are out of range because the science isn't there yet? Or why is so much of this NA? Yeah, I think, I think um, in, uh, um, the, uh, I think because there was no phase two, three clinical trial. <laughs> Oh. That's the only reason why we put NA in this. Oh, okay, order. okay. Yeah. Do you exactly. have any you know, phase two or three clinical trial on that particular target? Do you have any uh, uh, pets, some favorites on this list? Um, you know, I once again, I I think that um, uh, to me the best things. I apologize mm -hmm. if, if there's too much noise. Um, to me, the best thing is is uh, pathways where you can inhibit multiple arms of the pathway or multiple uh, different enzymes as opposed to uh, targeted therapy. Again, a concept that's completely the opposite of what most uh, drug developers uh, try to think. And again, it's because if you inhibit one metabolic pathway, the, the tumors are, um, are gonna find a way to get around it. So inhibitors that can inhibit a process uh, by hitting multiple parts of that process, uh, I think are the ones that are um, the, gonna be the most uh, fruitful. That would be my number one. And then my number two is, I don't be afraid of inhibiting a pathway that's found in multiple other cells. It could be, it turns out to be toxic, right? But on the other hand, I think that fear is inhibiting 
um, is inhibiting the development of um, many of those um, drugs on, on, on that list. So the next question, you've answered this pretty much, but I want to go back to it because the person who asked it is fairly prominent, a man named Greg Delgoff, Delgoff, pardon me. He's a metabolism expert and the newly minted editor of the, uh, in chief of the journal Immunology. I, I reached out and said, you know, what do you got a question for Jonathan? And the, the question was, what explains the very impressive ex, uh, effects of glutaminase inhibition in vivo, given the important role for uh, glutamine metabolism in T cells. You more or less answered this, but um, there are several flavors of T cells, multiple flavors, one of which is also a T reg. Uh, is it really discreet that you're not touching any of these T, -t cells subtypes with uh, glutamine inhibition? Yeah, so I, I think one of the, uh, so one thing I like to point out is that uh, Greg Delgoff was my PhD student. <laughs> so actually, I, I take it as a personal compliment that you hot, that you hold him in such high regard because you know, maybe I was a decent teacher. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think again that, you know, for example, you can read in the literature and, and we would believe that this is absolutely true that if you inhibit glutamine metabolism, you might promote Tregs, regs right? And, and, and I think that that, you know, that certainly under the right uh, circumstances uh, could be the case. All I can, t you know, the most important thing is that um, it's going to be dependent upon, um, it's going to be dependent upon uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the microenvironment and the signals that the T cells are getting. So for example, if the, if, um, if the number of T regs may go up a little bit when we use our drug, the bottom line is, is that the vast majority of the effect is promoting uh, this, you know, the CD8 T cell memory and anti uh, tumor uh, responses. And I think, you know, again, T regs are very interesting. T regs actually represent something very interesting because you might have thought that we would get more T regs in the tumor microenvironment. We, you know, we never really yes. saw that. Um, you know, if it, again, it, when we initially started the experiments, we might have been worried about that. But I think part of it too is that if you think about it, if the tumor microenvironment is sort of an anti effector environment, that's going to promote cytokines and environment that will lead to the differentiation of T Rex, right? But then if you metabolically block the tumor, right? And so now the environment is really favorable for the effector response, effector cytokines that are going to promote um, the differentiation of cells to become effectors, Th1 and CD8 um, CTLs. Then since you're not promoting the Tregs, uh, the, the effect of glutamine in terms of enhancing them is far less because there aren't that many Tregs to um, to uh, um, promote. The other okay. thing is, and we, we haven't really explored this, but you know, I, I told you we absolutely explored it with the myeloid derived suppressor cells. Is that and and actually he's shown some of this data as well. And, you know, his group has shown that T regs they program themselves to live well in the tumor microenvironment, right? And if we're changing the tumor microenvironment, well, then that programming no longer is beneficial. And that's exactly what we saw with the MDS, with the myeloid derived suppressor cells. And like I said, we haven't looked really in depth in terms of the Tregs, but that would be what, you know, one reason why you might, why we don't see an increase in Tregs. And again, it's actually very consistent with a lot of the work that he's done, which has shown that the Tregs really adapt themselves for living well in, in, in an acidic environment. His recent paper, on the lactate uh, transporter in Tregs is an example of that. So if we're making the environment less acidic, you can imagine then we're, you know, th these cells are geared for lactate and now suddenly there's a lot less lactate around, so. All right, so I wanna thank you not just for that answer, but the work you saved me because Greg is gonna do one of these events for us in January. <clears throat> and now I have some really solid content. So thank you for that. So um, to our audience, if it's not clear by now, cancer metabolism is an increasingly big deal. Uh, some, even to the point of where investigators are going back to look at commonly used cancer drugs to rethink about how they actually work. I mean, chemotrexid is a metabolism drug. But uh, I wanna talk about more- Yeah, actually, yeah, that, go ahead. that's a good point is that, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because 
you know, we use the term chemotherapy, obviously, right? But if you look at the, look at the drugs that are still around, they're still around because they're pretty effective, right? And, and a lot, and a bunch of them like 5-FU, right. um, methotrexate, which we still use, pemetrexate is just a better version of it. These, in the modern era, if these were developed today, these would be called metabolic inhibitors, you know, but because they were developed a long time ago, we call them chemotherapy. But in fact, a lot, uh, uh, maybe not a lot, but a bunch of the very successful chemotherapy drugs are indeed just metabolic uh, drugs. Excellent. Now, um, I reached out to someone else, a friend of my network. His name is Brad, Brad Reinfeld. Uh, he's in Kim Ramfeld's lab at Vanderbilt, and I asked him to cite a few papers from this year that he thought was particularly impactful. Uh, oh, and here he is uh, playing bass with the checkpoints. This will be Jim Allison's band. A and mind you, Brad's an MD PhD student in training. So for any young people on the line, if you want an example of how to really network, you're looking at Brad hitting the jackpot. So one of Brad's recommendations, this is from EMBO, titled Very Low Carbohydrate, Very Low Carbohydrate Diet Enhances Human T Cell Immunity Through Immune Metabolic Reprogramming. And earlier I mentioned Patrick, uh, the, he is the keyboard player for the checkpoints. He says, you know, fruit is nature's candy and this is a warning. Patrick has in fact been on a keto diet for years for all the reasons we've been describing. So why do we wait for more effective drugs? Uh, does diet hold any promise? I mean, where's all this glutamine coming from? Anyway, your diet everywhere? Yeah. So. This is a, this is an in, interesting uh, situation. So you can, you know, cure or make tumors shrink in mice by altering their diet. That's on, on you, you know, you can do that. It's very exciting. And we know that, you know, there's certainly um, scientific rationale for absolutely for the things, you know, like a keto diet and um, for, uh, you, you know, um, for helping the cause in terms of um, you know, getting tumors to shrink, but, but this is what, but, but as a clinician too, uh, I have some, uh, uh, um, I have some reservations because, um, you, you're not going to cure someone who has a lot of cancer, unless it's an extraordinarily unusual cancer is not going to be cured by diet. And some patients think that's going to be the case. If it were, we would be doing it. I assure you. Okay. So that's number one. Number two, um, tumors are um, really um, clever and selfish. So that if you do these diets where you limit the intake of uh, glucose, which probably is a good thing anyway, the tumor wins. So whatever glucose you have, the tumor will take, right? And, um, and so, you know, hmm. it certainly may be able to help, you know, may not be a bad thing. But like I said, I worry because if you're a patient with cancer, you could go on this extreme keto diet and wither away and be sickly, and that's not going to help. Whereas we give you, you know, if we give you a metabolic inhibitor and you eat healthy, then you're going to be far better, better off. And so, again, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to come across as someone who's against healthy diets or even, you know, decreasing your glucose and, you know, for cancer patients and everything like that. But I don't think, um, at least right now, you know, that, that by itself, or even in, it, it, that's not, it's just not going to do it. And so, um, because the tumors are really clever. And so if you, if you like um, change your diet, they'll figure out to be the ones over your body to get what they, what they need ultimately. And so, again, I wouldn't, it's not like I'm against it or anything, but I think that, um, Ultimately, I don't see that as uh, going to be the the, the the true answer to this. So. Okay, I want to call out um, two more things, both from conferences, and Brad alluded to this with the other article from JCI that he selected, which was selective glutamine metabolism inhibition in tumor cells improves tumor T lymphocyte activity in triple negative breast cancer. I bring this up because San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference kicks off tomorrow. They have an entire poster section that's dedicated to tumor metabolism. And I would uh, steer listeners to one poster in particular. It says the effect of metformin on metabolic markers associated with breast cancer risk, phase two trial in overweight premenopausal women. Um, 
Doctor, it's been observed that cancer patients on metformin seem to have better outcomes than one would expect. Do we have any idea mechanistically why? Yes, yeah, so metformin, you know, which is type two diabetes drugs, it has two, it has two effects that are potentially of interest. One is, is an AMP kinase activator, which ultimately might even inhibit the mTOR pathway. The other is it's actually a weak yet nonetheless uh, complex, I think complex one inhibitor or inhibitor of mitochondrial uh, function. And so again, these are things that you can imagine that if you're doing this, you're going to ultimately um, thwart in some way growth of, um, of tumor because certainly, uh, as I mentioned, mitochondrial function and even mTOR and or AMP kinase may, um, uh, uh, and or, um, you, you know, having inhibited AMP kinase and, um, and, and, and the other pathways being activated um, would, would promote tumor growth. So, so metformin, there's been some interesting uh, data uh, and, I, and I, think it's, I think it's real, and, but, it, but you know, kind of my, uh, and, and maybe even, you know, like if you took like, uh, you know, there are these huge studies of taking people on metformin for which I think it's the number one used drug in the world. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, versus not on, and you can show that the people on metformin have lower um, incidence of cancer versus not, you, you know, I think all that's true and all has relates to, you know, this sort of like helping the cause of inhibiting uh, uh, tumor growth or, or maybe even um, in some regards, you know, you know, development to more aggressive tumors. But, but kind of, I'm gonna be honest with you, you're not gonna cure cancer with metformin, right? And right. so, um, so, so yeah, you're not going to cure cancer with metformin, and um, and uh, and I think it's given us some great clues as to what, for example, there are um, mitochondrial complex inhibitors that are in the clinic right now being evaluated. A lot of them are actually, you know, pretty toxic. That's because they're really potent compared to metformin, for example. Um, uh, but um, so, so I think the metformin story is real and interesting, but it really is, I look at it as just like a means of informing us in terms of potential pathways that maybe we want to hit harder, actually. Okay, I'm gonna mention just one more meeting because it's all happening in real time. Then we're gonna go to questions from uh, the audience. Uh, this is from ESMO IO, which was like last week. Uh, and there was a presentation, the metabolic intervention during CAR T cell manufacturing improves persistence and anti-tumor efficacy. So this is all happening in real time, real fast. Uh, and now let's go to the questions. Let me see what we have. Wait, so oh, who's, yeah. who's study, who, who published that study? I'm gonna to have to come back to you with the speaker. I didn't note the speaker. Anyway, so I would say that totally makes sense to me. And in fact, we are learning, actually that's a, if you let me, I'll, I'll two, two seconds on this. So that's actually an excellent point. All media was developed a long time ago. Remember, RPMI is Roswell Park uh, Medical Institution, was developed um, to um, promote as much growth of cells as possible, right? Because okay. we needed cells, right? I mean, it was like a tour de force. It was great. You could take a tumor, put it in culture and grow it, right? And so what we're learning though, is that that's not necessarily the best thing for for example, for making um, cells that we want to live a long time. And so th this concept of altering the media to make better CAR T cells, I think is totally in line in what we understand with uh, about, um, you know, immunometabolism. And so, so yeah. And, and also, it also reflects why some of our in vitro studies, like again, in industry, like they'll, they'll test the drug against like 50 different cell lines in vitro. And then they'll be excited or not excited based on that test. I mean, it could turn out that a lot of the growth characteristics in vitro are completely irrelevant to what we see in vivo. So, you know, in part because of the media that's there. Okay. And this next question comes from, well, does, we, we don't talk about where they come from. So what do you think of upregulation of cyaloglycans on tumor cells do uh, correlated to poor clinical outcomes. Some research shows that cyaloglycans are uh, upregulated in exhausted T cells, which suppress T cell function. Here's the question. Do you think removing sialic acids on both T cells and tumor cells potentiate an anti-tumor immune response? 
Yeah, I think that, um, so um, again, uh, I think, you know, so the, first of all, this is kind of, that's really, it's really complex. That's why it's taken a while to kind of figure this out. But, but this is an example of, you know, metabolic programming, you know, serving, you know, function, right? M meaning the function of the tumor is try to grow and invade as much as possible. And so the metabolism, the metabolic programs that uh, tumors are going to take are going to promote that both from an energetic, a substrate, and also in this case, um, a protective perspective. And so um, these um, types of uh, sialic acids certainly are generated through metabolites from metabolic pathways. And so again, it, what he shows is that by metabolically programming the tumor in a way that serves the tumor and also promotes the cell surface expression of these, um, you know, um, uh, sialic acids, you, you know, you're, the tumor is able to protect itself or promote invasion, protect itself from anti-tumor immune responses. So again, I think the the concept of um, the concept of inhibiting metabolic pathways to inhibit their generation is is kind of a cool uh, cool idea. And 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 I bet if you did that, you'd also be inhibiting other important functions for the growth of the tumor. So yeah, I, I, I think that that's. Uh, interesting line of inquiry. Okay. Well, I'm waiting for more questions to come in. I have many more questions of my own. We've not talked about the innate immune system at all. Is this any of this work relative to NK cells? Yeah, I think that um, certainly uh, NK cells, um, uh, you know, are going to be susceptible to, you know, kind of the hurdles that are thrown up by um, uh, um, from the tumor microenvironment. So, um, so for sure. And in fact, uh, th there is data out there that if you inhibit tumor, um, you know, tumor metabolism, you can enhance um, uh, NK cell function. And again, I think this is really important um, because, uh, it, it, you know, certainly one of the take home messages I got from attending SITSI was there was a lot more work on, you know, NK cells are sort of making a comeback. Uh, or maybe they were never gone, but certainly they seem more prominent than they um, than they were. And uh, and I think targeting metabolism and adding that with an NK cell type therapy is um, is certainly something um, worthwhile. I mean, the one thing that struck me about CC was all the talk of macrophages. I mean, a macrophage car. I mean, there was a lot of stuff. So um, back to the questions. So we all know, sadly, that tumors are heterogeneous. Is it reasonable to say that a, a metabolism drug would hit all the cells or are some cells just not doing much? That wouldn't affect yeah, yeah. No, so that, that's actually a great, um, that's a great question as well. And so let me tell you, so, you know, when our drug that targets 11 uh, different glutamine pathways, guess what? It doesn't cure all cancers. Right. I mean, actually, right. it's amazing to me that it doesn't, because how could you disable all these pathways and the tumors still grow? Right. And 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 so the point is, is that um, exactly what you're saying is that, you know, even, you know, with something that's so like it's such a broad um, inhibitor in terms of multiple different pathways related to metabolism, you still are going to have, um, you know, emergence of cells that are resistant, right, or that are that are getting around it. But here's the cool thing, and this is the cool thing about metabolism, is that um, what we envision and what, you know, one of the areas that I think is fruitful to work on is that, you know, w when you like block all glutamine pathways and, and you still get some cells that grow, I think what you, you're forcing the tumor to employ very specific alternative pathways. And so then the, the, the um, kind of challenge is if you, can, um, if you can find out what those alternative pathways are, you can readily inhibit them. In a sense, you're leading the tumor down an alley and, and although it can still grow, it's really um, stuck. And it, then if you block that pathway, you're, you're um, able to really inhibit its growth. And so that's why I think metabolism is such a fascinating target in terms of um, treating cancer, because even if the tumor gets around it, you could potentially, you know, kind of create the, the type of tumor that you want, um, you, you know, in terms of using another in, inhibitor, so. Did you get any sense from your work uh, in, in animals that 
the stage of the disease is more susceptible, like are METs more strongly affected than the primary or anything like that? Yeah, so one thing that we found in our GCI paper that again, I thought was, you know, really, I, I thought it was really neat is that, so we did, it, actually, this is an interesting experiment. So um, what we noticed is actually in, in a breast cancer model called 4T1, uh, the student noticed that um, the, it, this is a case where the glutamine antagonist slowed down the growth of the primary tumor, which we put in the mammary fat pad, but it didn't cure the mice. So you give the glutamine antagonist and, and, and you know, we had the great effect, look, the tumor's growing slower, and, um, but it didn't cure the mice. But what they noticed is even when they let the experiment go for a really long time and the tumors really got to the point of being you know, really noticeable and large, the mice were still running around in the cage, no problem. They looked really healthy. This was in comparison to mice that were untreated. And it turned out that um, even in the cases where our drug was not in, you know, successful in shrinking down tumor growth, just slowing it down, it prevented metastasis to the lungs, right? And so, if you, so the primary tumors were, um, were still growing, but the lungs were pristine, no metastasis compared to the untreated mice where you saw metastasis all over the place. And so um, again, I, you know, this was really fascinating to me because it suggested that targeting metabolism, you can maybe prevent meta metastasis and or treat metastasis. And what we, you know, getting back actually to um, your IDO question, what we found was is that um, in the lungs of um, the mice that were untreated, we got this upregulation of myeloid derived suppressor cells and, and actually IDO and um, kynorhinin, which is the, uh, the metabolic product of the um, uh, metabolism of tryptophan, in the lungs of the vehicle treated mice, even before you saw metastasis. So it's like the groundwork was being laid metabolically. The, you know, like the garden was being made fertile for the Mets to grow, right? Okay. And in, in the glutamine treated mice, we didn't, we didn't see that, um, we, you know, we didn't see that at all. And so I, 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 again, that got me really excited that this is a really po potentially potent area um, to um, treat and or prevent metastasis, maybe even by just altering the tumor microenvironment in a sense before there's a tumor you know, or before there's noticeable tumor, so. All right, we just have a couple minutes, and in that, I, I want to uh, use my host privilege to just call up, it's something that I saw on my feed the other day. It's graphic number 10, Morgan, if we could have that, which just seemed like so cool. Apparently, these tumor cells are swiping mitochondria from T cells. Is, is this like a red right LF field or something that's discussed, or... I, 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 I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's something that's really discussed. Um, you, you know, these type of things, you know, really kind of make you think and, and about, you know, think about things in ways that maybe were completely off your uh, radar screen. The concept of, you know, cells um, grabbing things from each other and or delivering things to each other in this way is, uh, you, you know, I think, you know, sort of gaining um, some traction in various ways. And it, it really kind of remains to be seen how uh, important uh, it is. I mean, it's certainly right in light of what we talked about. It's kind of a neat concept that the tumor would be so bold as saying, "I need more mitochondria to make more stuff to grow," so it's going right. to grab it uh, from the T cells. But yeah, so <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for indulging me. Uh, and for for everything today, uh, this is Dr. Jonathan Powell. He's from Calico which hopefully we will discuss the next time we meet. Uh, thank you again, sir. Morgan, if you could take us out. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Powell. And thank you, Neil, for a great discussion. Um, have a great afternoon, everyone. Great, thank you. Jonathan, thank you.